When it comes right down to it, food is practically the whole story every time. When it comes right down to it, food is practically the whole story every time. Uh, words that could not be truer, um, in my own opinion, and I'll bet many of my own colleagues sitting in the audience, as well as many of you, whether you're a scientist or not. Food is essential for life. It is fundamental to the development of civilizations and to societies, and it's also very delicious. It's pleasurable, it is a celebration of family, of friends, and of culture, and plays an enormous role in our life. And in many ways, what we choose to put into our body, one of the most intimate relationships that we actually have, is a deep reflection of, of our values and our ethics, and in turn can, in part, help to shape and demonstrate and reflect the world in which we live. So uh, good afternoon, my name is PK Newby, and uh, I'm gonna jump right into our, you know, what I do because we have a limited time together, but I'll be talking about researching and communicating nutrition in the 21st century. I'm gonna begin with my own story of food. So actually it comes to it through the very deeply pleasurable uh, relationship, which is that I love to eat. So I grew up cooking, baking, baking and gardening with my mother starting at around age five. And I started working in restaurants as a teenager. And then I worked in a vegetarian restaurant cooking um, in my 20s to help pay for grad school. And as much as I love cooking, I decided to keep my culinary passions on the side and instead pursue the science of food. And of course, that's what we're gonna be talking, talking about, but you'll see why that cooking piece is relevant to my own story. Well, my story began at Columbia University where I started and developed an interdisciplinary program in public health nutrition. Public health nutrition is sort of as it sounds. It's very wide and broad and encompasses many, many aspects. I myself was focusing on the socio-medical aspects of why what we eat matters, specifically thinking about the psychological, sociological, and environmental aspects that shape eating behavior. After all, if we don't understand the drivers of why people choose to eat what they do, we can't obviously uh, be able to affect lasting and meaningful change. Well, during that time at Columbia, I had what I hope and expect is the um, experience of many of my colleagues and many students of the audience, which is that I had a life-changing experience through the best class that I ever had. It was a class called Nutrition Ecology. And I bet that most of you out there are not familiar at all with this concept. And in fact, nutrition scientists are not familiar with this concept. I learned of it from, not surprisingly, from an ecologist. This was in 1995. The concept was coined in 1980s, and she had been talking about it, of course, since 1960s. Uh, nutrition ecology changed the way I think about food and indelibly altered my entire career that experience. I hope all of you have such an experience. Um, most of you, when you think about nutrition, you think about its effects on your health. Nutrition is a basic biological life science. It's rooted in biochemistry and physiology. That's what most nutrition scientists do. That's what I'm also trained to do as well. But my social science background comes in, and I love this framework, in which it's not just about health. It's about environment. It's about economy. It's about society. Aha, nutrition ecology is not just about you. When it comes to what you eat, it is not just about you. And of course, the word new is in quotes because it is not a new concept at all, as you just heard. However, it's slowly beginning to take hold, as we know, because I think you might have heard already today from some of my colleagues that people are increasingly thinking about the environmental aspect of why what we eat matters, in addition to, of course, many of the other public health and influences of why what we eat matters. So then, I'm go I went on to focus on health, in addition to my love of food and cooking. I also did grow up and very much interested in health. So of course, nutrition is the natural science for me. I knew I wanted to be a scientist. So after getting my master's degrees at Columbia, I went, came here to Harvard to study nutritional ep epidemiology, which many of you also already heard from my colleagues earlier today, so you know it is the study of diet and disease in populations. Nutritional epidemiology uses largely statistics and looks at diet and disease in large data sets. And I decided to focus my training on obesity because, as you all know in this room, 
it is an, a, of epidemic proportions, and that was increasingly recognized, especially at that time in the early 90s. So I knew that I wanted to get, dedicate my time there because, of course, obesity is preventable. And I have this slide up just so you know that, as you probably appreciate some of them, people think obesity, oh, it's a risk factor for type 2 diabetes, for cardiovascular disease, for metabolic syndrome, and the like, but it influences an entire host of systems throughout the body. It is not a matter of looks. It is not a matter of self-esteem. Obesity is a matter of health. And so despite my occasional discomfort of about talking about weight, given its unfair uh, role in society, from that perspective, from a social perspective, from a health perspective, I want people to live a long, long time. So obesity is a matter of health, and I started spending my time there. Well, nutritional epidemiology is founded on what I call a single nutrient paradigm. Many sciences, including nutrition, is reductionist in nature. Scientists, by definition, reduce things to the smallest components often because that is what we were able to isolate and therefore determine cause and effect. Reductionism has obviously been great, a great gains in nutrition and other sciences in understanding why things happen, of course. But it left me wanting. It left me wanting as someone who is trained in the social sciences. My first study of childhood obesity looked exactly at those things, single nutrients, fat, fiber, the kinds of things you would expect. Well, studies like those did, in fact, help me develop skills as an epidemiologist. But as I mentioned, they left me very wanting given what I know about food. The reductionist model simply did not make sense to me. Well, I wasn't the only one, as you can imagine. So during that time, it, this is now again still the 90s, um, when I came to Harvard, there were colleagues there who were starting to think about the concept of dietary patterns. So let's go to that. Actually, I'm going to go back for a moment before I get to that slide. Dietary patterns are sort of as they sound. It's looking at the complete diet rather than just single nutrients or single foods. So it was a very exciting time, and I was pleased to learn from colleagues. And since that time, it has really taken off. I still study obesity and other chronic diseases, but I've spent much of my career developing these dietary pattern methods. And they really started to take off in the 1990s, and they exponentially grew in the 21st century. They are now a validated and common method in nutritional and epidemiology that greatly expanded our ability to see effects of diet on disease. And by the way, it might have occurred to you, in addition to the basic scientific limitations of reductionism, we know that the whole is greater than the sum of its part. We know that from the social sciences. We also just know that from a very intuitive sense. No one sits down to a big bowl of nutrients for dinner, right? They sit down to a meal. Their actual exposure is based upon their overall dietary pattern. So I have this slide up here simply for the benefit of my scientific colleagues who are in the audience, specifically those in the social sciences, because these methods are from the social sciences. And I thank you, because they've been incredible in this measurement of dietary patterns. There's just a few of them up there. I'm clearly not going to spend time on this slide. But patterns can be measured empirically. They're data-driven or theoretically, like as if someone's a vegetarian or as if you use scores to measure their diet and the like. These are just a few examples of pattern methods, but there are many, many more used today. Now, just as diet, in which the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, well, we know that diet is part of a larger risk profile, including lifestyle, genetics, and the environment. So hearkening back a little bit to nutrition ecology, but this is how risk works as well. So in fact, diet is part of this whole host of factors that together intersect and interact dynamically dynamically over time to influence our risk. And this is especially important in understanding the etiology of complex and chronic diseases like obesity. So system science, another method that nutritional epidemiologists are borrowing, um, is a big part of what I do now. So I take dietary patterns and I use system sciences to look at overall risk and development of obesity. So these have been very exciting areas, obviously, from a research perspective. What have they shown us? Well, my own studies, which have been in dietary pattern methods, as you've heard, in chronic disease risk, my own studies, which have spanned um, across all, many age, age ranges, across three, three countries, across eight different cohorts, obviously just a tiny, tiny amount of the thousands and thousands of studies that have been performed by nutrition scientists. And it has shown that a plant-based diet is an energy balance, of course, leads to lower weight, less disease, higher quality of life, and longevity. Now, at the same time, our colleagues in the environmental 
And agricultural sciences have shown that that very same diet is most protective when it comes to protecting our planet. And that's good news. And again, we see that intersection of nutritional ecological thinking. So where does that leave us? Well, in closing, we know that this is protective. So of course, that begs the question, why are people slowly killing themselves and the planet through suboptimal diets? Obviously, that's a big question, one I spend a lot of time thinking about, and far beyond the space and scope of the time I have with you now. So I leave you with one thought alone, which is that despite the phenomenal gains in the digital revolution, the access, the volume of information, there's a huge amount of anti-science and junk science out there. So that's why I became impassioned about communicating nutrition, meeting people where they're at, through books, television, blogging, media, and like, bringing it back to cooking, hearkening Derek Box, the previous president of Harvard University, to go beyond the ivory tower to changing the way people eat, leading to a healthier people and a healthier planet. So I'll leave you again with Vonnegut's words. When it comes right down to it, food is practically the whole story every time. And to that, I will add how that story ends is up to us. It is up to you. Vote with your vote, vote with your fork, be the change in the world you wish to see. Thank you.